Hey, Carrie. Better late than never. Yes, exactly what I say. And I got some questions, and some of them been ar- kicking around the mailbox for a while as well. So uh, if you wrote and, you know, we didn't get to you as soon as possible, well, hey, better late than never. So here's one from Ernie. And said, could you ask uh, John this question? What incentive is there for America to manipulate gold futures to keep gold prices down if this helps China and Russia to buy cheaper and thus more physical gold? Lower gold prices simply aid the de-dollarization process, process, as they say in Canada. I would think the U.S. would want to maintain the U.S. dollar power by a controlled higher gold price to slow the tonnage amounts regularly purchased by China and Russia. Thanks in advance, Ernie. Well, what's your take on that, John? Well, it sounds like we're acting in a short-sighted way, doesn't it, Gary? <laughs> a surprise, surprise. You know, we we've um, we've been the victims of short-term thinking at pretty much every level in American society for the last 30 or 40 years. You know, we're doing the expedient thing. That is, we're borrowing lots of money in order to make our current life easier at the expense of hard times in the future. Uh, And this gold thing is just one more example of that. Basically, in, in the moment, it's good to have a weak gold price because gold is one of the ways you measure the dollar. In other words, if gold goes up, that means the dollar is going down, at least relative to gold. And that makes the guys running the U.S. monetary system look bad, makes them look incompetent. And since with a fiat currency, the only reason for it to exist or the only reason for it to have value is our confidence in the people running the currency. When it goes down relative to gold, That's systemically threatening. So what these guys are doing is choosing to support the dollar in the short run at the expense of the gold price. And yeah, it it basically puts gold on sale for all these other countries that are buying gold and brings forward the time at which they're going to have so much gold that they're going to be monetarily self-confident enough to tell us to take a hike, you know, because we're we're using the dollar, you know, besides maintaining the dollar at a, a value relative to gold that's unfavorable for us, we're also antagonizing the rest of the world by using the dollar to threaten other people and to coerce them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we threaten to uh, kick countries out of the the bank clearing system, the SWIFT system around the world. Um, We threaten to um, freeze the assets of government leaders who keep their money in the U.S. or other big banks. Uh, And we do lots of other things like that 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 makes us look like a bully using the power of the world's reserve currency to push other countries around. So – the combination of those two things, we're antagonizing other people with our dollars and we're depressing the price of gold, allowing other countries to solidify their monetary systems. Uh, you put those two things together and, and you get a situation in which it's getting easier and easier for other countries just to bypass us. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing examples of that all over the world right now where uh, Russia and China set up a bilateral trade deal where they use each other's currencies to buy energy or electronics or whatever from each other and don't need dollars at all for that. And once they, they find out (laughs) that it's pretty easy to do, uh, then that also just accelerates the process. So the time is coming when we lose the ability to use the dollar as a weapon Mm -hmm. and In the process, other countries figure out they don't need to hold as many dollars as reserve assets and therefore feel free to sell dollars on the open market, which pushes the value of the dollar down, which, you know, which punishes us for our bad behavior in the past. You know, we'll have a currency crisis at some point because we set up the conditions for it. Uh, So that's coming. Might not be right away, though, because... Still, when there's a a crisis in the world, everybody still piles into dollars because the the dollar is seen as the safest place to hide out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually, that will change and it won't be seen that way anymore. But right now, 
we still have the power to coerce people with the dollar. And apparently we're going to keep using it until we don't have it anymore. Yeah, use it or lose it, I guess. And uh, for right now, there really isn't much choice for these countries. Uh, they don't like it, but the Irans of the world are kind of left, uh, and the Venezuelas are really kind of left with a lot of problems. And uh, you know, not to say that all the problems of those countries are the fault of the U.S., because they certainly aren't, but they've kind of been uh, excised from the world economic system. And, uh, you know, when that's going to be remedied, I don't know, or what they're going to have to do to get back in the good graces. But what you're saying is definitely, definitely true. Uh, dollar primacy is has been on the wane for the past decade. So... Along those lines, we're talking about currencies uh, losing their dominance. So the number two currency, at least for a while, was uh, the euro. And Thomas has a question. Uh, okay, uh, well, let's get to the hi, Carrie. I have a question for John Rabino again. According to German economist Dr. Marcus Kroll, who is involved in 80% of the stress test of German banks, the euro will blow up around 2020. He has cracked the numbers and thinks that this is the time when the flattened or inverted yield curve has completely destroyed banks' balance sheets. During one of his recent presentations in Germany, he mentioned that the German finance ministry has, quote, contingency plans to recapitalize the then bankrupt German Central Bank via forced mandatory mortgages on property owners. Property owners. What does John think about that? Do governments know what is coming? Thank you guys. FSN rocks. Best regards, Thomas. Hey, let me just make one comment. So the concept of like, hey, handing somebody a bill after you've like worked for 30 years to pay off your mortgage. Not many people do that nowadays. We know that. But the few that do, you've worked all this time, you've been responsible, you've saved, you've become debt free. And then the government hands you a bill in the form of a mortgage on your house. I just can't really picture that. But you know that governments are capable of anything, especially when they start to uh, when they start living in fear that uh, the jig is up. What's your thoughts, John? Well, uh, about the timing of this, I've, I've learned not to try to play on that field. You know, it's, it's really hard to predict when something is going to happen. It's a lot easier to see imbalances building up and, and know that eventually those imbalances have to be rectified somehow. Uh, whether Europe's problems come to a head in 2020, or 2019 or 2025. I don't know about that. But clearly, they're, they're making some really fundamental mistakes, just as all the developed world countries are. Um, they're, they're building up either huge amounts of official debt or even bigger amounts of unfunded liabilities. In a lot of cases, it's, it's both of those things. Um, they're allowing their banks to or maybe encouraging their banks to make some really unwise loans. For instance, the, the Spanish banks lent the equivalent of 5% of Spain's GDP to Turkey. <laughs> and Turkey, of course, Smart. blew up just lately. It's one that of the big emerging market brilliant. crises. Brilliant move. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like and, and, you know, 5% of GDP within a banking system is systemically threatening. If Turkey just flat out defaulted on everything, yeah, uh, the, a lot of the Spanish banks wouldn't survive. Spain's government would potentially go bankrupt trying to bail them out, and you'd have a Europe-wide bailout um, necessitated for the ECB. You know, the, the European Central Bank would have to come in and start bailing out banks right and left, which then would put a huge amount of pressure on the euro because the European balance sheet is, you know, it, it goes on and on like that. And that's coming out there somewhere. Um, and then you can expect the European governments to start behaving in ways that seem crazy today, but will yes. be the least bad alternative in their minds 
when it happens. And yeah, some kind of wealth tax where they uh, they look at people who have expensive real estate and say, oh, you got to give us a little piece of that action, you know, and, or bank accounts or stock brokerage accounts. You know, we, we in the U.S. have 401ks and IRAs that are these huge pots, multi-trillion dollar pots of untaxed money. And the government really wants those. So they might come after IRAs and 401ks when the time comes. In Europe, maybe it's real estate. I don't know. But we, we can expect the governments that are rapidly going bankrupt to try to get some cash to tide them over, at least to the, um, you know, through the next election cycle, one way or another. Uh, mm-hmm. So crazy stuff is almost inevitable, historically speaking. If you look at governments going bankrupt in the past, and, and many, many of them did, uh, a lot of them end up doing things that that would have seemed really surprising and disturbing to people just a couple of years before that. And, and this time around should be no exception. In fact, it, it almost can't be an exception because the numbers are so much bigger than in the past. We're making mistakes on a bigger scale, which means the crazy that comes because of those mistakes is going to be on a bigger scale also. Uh, so we are going to have a lot of stuff to talk about that we probably can't even imagine right now. But two years from now, we're going to be saying, oh, my God, did you see what Sweden is doing? And, and did you see what the ECB, you know, and, and it's going to go on and on like that, where, where these countries – Uh, just start behaving in ways that that to us right now seem unbelievable, but they will have to do that in their own minds because the alternative will be national bankruptcy or regional bankruptcy or a hyperinflation or, um, you know, some kind of geopolitical thing that's unthinkable right now. So that's all coming and it's not coming for any kind of ideological or mystical magical reasons. It's coming just because we borrowed way too much money. And when you borrow way too much money, crazy things happen. Yeah, it's just like uh, when people do a lot of drugs. There was an article about some woman today. They found her running in the park in St. Petersburg, Florida, naked from a giant spider that she believed was chasing her. And I wonder if debt can make you hallucinate and act uh, psychotic. You think so? Oh, well, based on history, yeah. There there are all these examples um, throughout history of countries messing up their currency, seeing hyperinflation get going, and then making rules um, that, for instance, um, the Roman Empire decreed that sons had to follow in their father's business footsteps. In other words, they had to keep the family business going, and they were not allowed to close the business, even though the government was making it unprofitable to stay in business. And there was a death penalty attached to Uh, that. If you tried to close your business, they would kill you. Oh, my God. Uh, France in the 17th century passed a law that that um, that said if a merchant refused to take the government's currency and demanded gold instead, even though the government's currency was being inflated away, there was also a death penalty for that, too. They would kill you if you refused to take rapidly depreciating currency and wanted gold instead for whatever you were selling. Uh, Stuff like that happened in the past. Uh, I'm I'm not saying we're going to have death penalties attached to financial behavior anytime soon, but there will be things like wealth taxes, for instance, where they they look around and see who has a lot um, and notices that most people don't have much thanks to government mismanagement and go after the people who have a lot. Um, and in addition to, for instance, income taxes or property taxes, they just level another or levy another 10% on your net worth. Um, or they go into your bank account and say, all right, you need to get rid of these securities and replace them with government bonds. Mm -hmm. And that way you'll help us with the deficit. It's your patriotic duty. Stuff like that is completely possible in the not too distant future, which is why you buy real assets and then look to portability for some of those assets. In other words, a, a office building might hold its value in a hyperinflation, but it's also a really easy target for a government to come in and tax. Whereas some gold or silver coins might, they, they might be more portable or some kind of cryptocurrency if, if they're working at the time. 
Yeah. Um, that there also might be something that you can move out of the range of the local taxing authorities. So the, the kind of diversification that you do um, in anticipation of something like a wealth tax is to make some of your capital mobile and get it out of there when the time comes. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah, I, I could see this. You know, there already are some weird elements of the tax law that don't that seem to be pretty anomalous in a lot of respects. For instance, uh, the, there's an IRS rule that if you keep too much cash, this used to be the case anyway, uh, that they would tax you on it when you kept too much cash in the bank as a corporation. Uh, do you remember that? It was a really strange law. That had uh, no I, I don't remember that, but, but but they did that in effect in a lot of places just the last time around by by um, pushing interest rates down into negative territory. Yeah. So yeah, if you keep uh, a bank account that's yielding negative 1%, somebody's getting that 1%, right? And it's mm -hmm. the government and the banking system that's uh, that's basically taxing your account. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's just really kind of bizarre the things that they can come up with. You know, when you look at taxes that certain states have come up with, like New York and Cal California and Illinois, you know, they tax the taxes. I mean, it's it's madness what they come up with, John. I mean, the if they had used as much creativity to come up with these new money-grabbing taxes, if they use as much creativity to, like, solve the budget dilemma as it was instead of creating new taxes, they might actually get something accomplished here, you know? Yeah, uh, that, that is absolutely right. Because they, they put a lot of creativity and a lot of energy into squeezing new income streams out of, uh, out of their citizens and a lot less energy and creativity into actually solving problems. But that's, that's the nature of government. You know, it, we, we have to have governments. They're a necessary evil. But when they get too big and start to spin out of control, you get today's world. <laughs> and so <clears throat> people learn, <clears throat> excuse me, people learn that lesson over and over again throughout history that you have to limit the size and scope of government or else it becomes a self-perpetuating um, monster whose only goal is to get bigger and bigger. Um, then you have the hyperinflations of history and the civil wars of history and the, uh, the great depressions. That's what flows from too big, too powerful, too free a government. Mm -hmm. And then after that, people institute controls on the size of government and things are relatively good for a while. But Governments always break free of those bonds because there's always an emergency. Yeah. There's always, always a war. Always a reason. <laughs> yeah. There's always a natural disaster. There's always something that in the moment makes it seem completely reasonable to ramp up government spending and increase taxation. Uh, and, you know, maybe those things are reasonable in the moment, but the net effect of it is that you've created a monster that then you have to deal with. <laughs> and, and, once a government gets as big as ours, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, and a banking system that is basically part of the government gets as big as our banking system, there's really no reasoning with it. So you either have to just let it run until it destroys the system and then try to rebuild, or you have to oppose it in some way that makes you kind of an enemy of the state. It almost makes you a traitor. But... Um, as the old saying from the, uh, the revolutionary war times goes, mm. the, um, the tree of Liberty must periodically be <laughs> watered with the blood of patriots. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not in any way calling for a civil war. I'm just saying that historically, um, things get crazy when government gets too big and you, you end up with people doing things that they never thought they'd do, but they have no choice but to oppose the, the kind of injustice that's taking place as the government grows out of control and starts sucking the wealth out of, um, out of its citizens. And we're there now, you know? So what happens in Europe, um, to get back to the original question, is, uh, is going to seem really extreme by any modern standard, but it'll probably happen. It'll probably happen here, it'll probably happen in Japan very probably will happen in China. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, there's no way around it at this point. There's only surviving it, not changing it or stopping it. Right. Yeah, it's a certain inevitability. We've been talking about it. We might be talking about it for another few years, but eventually we kind of have to be right because there's going to be this great, it's either going to be a great crash or a great reconciliation, right? It's going to be one or the other, a rebalancing, a rejiggering. People call it a reset. I don't think a reset is quite accurate, but I do think that something has to give here unsustainability nothing changes that it's unsustainable therefore something has to happen something's got to give somewhere and when you're like putting your faith in government which way too many of you out there do then uh hey it's all bets are off anything anything john can happen here yeah. Well, the, the monetary reset thing, Kerry, is, is by far the most favorable scenario, which makes it one of the least likely. But uh -huh. uh, if the um, the world's major governments just got together some weekend and said, all right, you know what, we've got to go back to sound money because clearly having fiat currencies is, is going to blow up the world if we don't do something about it now. So on Sunday night, they announced that henceforth, the major currencies of the world are just names for certain amounts of gold which is what they were for 200 years during the classical gold standard when we had steady growth um, and zero inflation, two centuries of that. Um, so if they, they do that, they announce it on Sunday night and there's this huge burst of inflation because we're basically devaluing all the major currencies uh, in one stroke instead of like we're doing it now, piecemeal, a little at a time. Uh, so the people who trusted the governments and had all their money in local currencies get hurt. Their savings diminishes by 50% or 80% or whatever the devaluation turns out to be. And the people who own real assets are either protected or enriched because in local ter currency terms, the value of their assets just went way up. Uh, and, and so you have this burst of inflation, a little bit of dislocation, and then you move forward with a sound money system. That would be so much better than the other alternatives, which are a hyperinflation or a, a great depression that wipes out the debt through default. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are a lot more likely because they don't require government to voluntarily give up power. And a monetary reset requires the guys running the monetary system to say, all right, we're going to give up the ability to just print as much new currency as we, we feel like. So we won't be able to fight unlimited wars anymore and we won't be able to ramp up spending every election cycle for every conceivable constituency. You know, we'll, we'll have to actually prioritize going forward and we'll have to say no to our campaign contributors. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do that. Who's in the political that's class right now? But that's thing. what they would have to do to have a monetary reset. That's a bad thing. We know that. <laughs> it is if you're a senator. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not so bad if you're a bank and you've already known this was coming and you get to arbitrage it, right? Then it's well, it's a great thing. You just well, cashed in. See, that would be the one of the interesting things about a monetary reset is a lot of people have to know about it ahead of time. And most of them will try to front run it in some way. Exactly. I mean, who so would? but but that would make it impossible to actually do the reset if the currency market starts spinning out of control ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So they need to keep it a secret, but some people need to know about it. Yeah. And they, they're going to, you know, even if they don't trade on their own account, they're going to call their brother in law in Tokyo or whatever and, and just tell them do this big thing right now. OK, because uh -huh. something's coming this weekend. Yeah. Um, and so it's possible that we see the currency markets just totally spin out of control and we have no idea why. But the reason why is that they're working on a monetary reset, but the word leaked. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so all the currency markets secret. are front running it. <laughs> it, can, it never stays secret. You see it in these countries that have devalued their currencies and always the market, there's a frenzy like the f week before where people are getting their bets in place and front running it. And you see it over and over and over again. This isn't anything new here, John. It's, it's been tried many times. Look, if there's more than two people involved in deciding this thing, there's no possible way to keep it a secret, right? I mean, how do you do it? 
Yeah, that, well, see, that's the thing. And you need way more than two people exactly. to do a, a coordinated global monetary reset. Yeah. And those are people who know how to trade. They have connections all over the financial uh -huh. world. They've got yeah. lots of people they can call and they're, secretly make trades. You they're know? Steve so Mnuchin. They're Steve, yeah. the Steve Mnuchins and Gary Cohns of the world. <laughs> so to think yeah, that you, you it's think nothing's Steve Mnuchin's leak. wife would let him... Um, not take advantage of something yeah. like this. It's of like, course. I can just insist. see he, <laughs> he comes home and he's like really stressed. Steve, you're looking so stressed today. Yeah. What's the matter? What What's going on here? I, I can't talk about it. And you know, like no guy is just going to keep this stuff secret from his wife, right? I mean, she's going to get it. She's going to get the information from him. And then she'll be on the phone with the next door. And you're not going to believe what my Steve is doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, before you know it, the all of Long Island uh, and Westchester County is going to be uh, in on the deal. I mean, it just can't work any other way, John. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's probably how it'll work, which yeah. means uh, we, we get the hyperinflation that they're trying to avoid compressed in the space of just a you know a couple of trading days <laughs> when yeah. the markets just collapse right and we get uh, some so. uh, civil unrest because the public will know at this point the public will understand that they've been gamed and they've been beaten and we're going to get civil unrest if and when this day should arise well yeah if if something like that happens and then jp morgan's trading desk reports a, a trillion dollar profit Mm -hmm. During the same process where yeah. other people's bank yeah. accounts are cut in oh, half, yeah. Um, yeah. that that would be bad. That'll go over big, won't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it it's also not impossible. These guys are pretty brazen. You know, hey, after the, uh, the bailouts in 2009, mm -hmm. we used trillions of dollars of taxpayer money to bail out the big banks. That same year, at the end, they paid out record year-end bonuses. Yeah. And they got away with it. So they think they can get away with anything. Well, because they have in the past. Yes. But there is a new sheriff in town. He doesn't seem to be beholden to these banksters. It's not to say that, I don't mean to say that he's, uh, you know, innocent here by any stretch. But oh. he's certainly, you know, uh, he's not with them, put it that way. To coin a, to, to a little play on a campaign slogan from the last election, right? <laughs> well, he's, he's not um, with him. He's not with her. Whatever you want to say, right? Yeah, but that that would just we, see with with Trump tried to engineer something like this. It just means that a different group of people would be front running it because you know he wouldn't be able to help himself. <laughs> he would <laughs> have to try and front run this uh, and try to make money off of his own deal. You know, you're and, really cynical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> correct, but very cynical. You know. Yeah, but by the time you know he's seventy years old. And he's been the same person for the last 50 yeah. years, you know, his yeah, entire public course. life. He's been that same guy. And that same guy would take advantage of this in a heartbeat. I can't believe who in their right mind wouldn't. It's like your last golden opportunity. No pun intended here, right? I mean, it's just uh, too good to pass up, really is. So, you know, somebody's going to be making a bucks. It might as well be you if you can figure out how to do it. Not that it's uh, it's just that simple, but it really is that simple, John. You know, this is this is what happens every time these manipulations, the magic rescue of the system is is contemplated, or you wind up in Argentina with the uh, overnight rates at sixty percent. That's real good for the economy too, isn't it? Well, see, that is our future unless we do something about this. It's taken a lot longer for us to get there because we're starting out with a you know vastly more resilient, more complex mm -hmm. system than Argentina. But the laws of finance are pretty clear on this. If you create too much currency, too much credit, um, and keep interest rates at artificially low levels while government spending is soaring, stuff happens to your currency. Argentina is a, is a good example of what we've got coming if we don't fix things shortly. And, and it, you know, it's possible that it's not possible to fix at this point yeah. because we've already borrowed too much money and something has to happen with that debt. We, we, you can't just wave a magic wand and make it go away. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to pay the price of overborrowing somehow, some way. And there's 
only a few ways in which that can happen. So, which is why you need to set things up now. You know, you need your precious metals, you need your well-chosen um, piece of real estate, you know, your college town rental property or your Costa Rica beachfront condo or something. You need all that stuff now because it's not clear how this plays out in terms of timing. It might happen soon or it might drag on and be tumultuous for five years or 10 years more. Um, either way you want real assets and you want to be minimizing your financial assets because there, there are very few ways that this could go in which most financial assets don't suffer. And you know, this isn't anything that we haven't seen before. It's just the potential magnitude of it could be so great. And, you know, basically billions of people throughout the world getting burned because it won't just be the dollar. It'll be every currency in the world because they're all fiat based and they're all based on on the mighty greenback, the once mighty greenback. So where is that going to leave us? Hey, you know, like question is, John, are we a stop clock here or is history on our side with what we're discussing here? Are we just a stop clock where everybody says, well, you know, you've been saying it for years like Gene Dixon used to make 50, 100 predictions a day. None of them would come true until one day she predicted that President Kennedy was going to be assassinated. And then she became a, a noted psychic. So are we noted stop, cl stop clockers or clock stoppers, whatever they call us? Well, you know what? It feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, his, history is pretty clear that when you make these mistakes, you get those results eventually. So it's the eventually part that's frustrating because it should have happened sooner. There's well, no way that the last 10 years should have happened. Yes. In, in other words, the 2008, 2009 crisis should have been definitive. It should have just mm -hmm. wiped out the global banking system and allowed yeah. us to start over. Uh, but instead we, uh, we tried an experiment where we just Mm -hmm. pushed interest rates to negative levels and borrowed trillions and trillions and trillions of, right. of new dollars and euros and yen um, and managed to buy ourselves 10 more years. But all that was was um, like a family where somebody loses a job just putting their whole life on credit cards for a while. <laughs> and they look fine because the neighbors That's don't know so that. Funny. They still see the SUV out front and the big house and everything. But um, those credit cards will inevitably blow up. Yes. And then they'll lose everything. And, and so we're, we're kind of in that stage of the process now where we're, we're still here, surprisingly, but we can't be for that much longer based on the numbers that we're building up. So no way to know when it happens, but when it does, it'll be, it'll be the big one. But, well, you know, it'll be history repeating, but it'll also be a departure from history because countries have blown up their domestic finances over and over again for the last 3000 years, but the world has never blown up its finances simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, every yeah. major country now has a fiat currency that with the possible exception of Russia, <laughs> um, they're, they're inflating away and yes. they're taking on too much debt. And so this time around, it's not going to be one country blowing up in the context of a sound money world. It's going to be the whole world. And that's different. Very different. You're correct. And yeah, we might be uh, stopped clockers, but, uh, but like we said, history really is, is on our side and history you know, it's definitely rhyming now, John. I mean, there's no two ways about it. It's rhyming bigly. And, you know, better to be ready than to not be ready. That's for sure. So I don't know what people think or what they wind up doing. But you know that uh, eventually the piper has got to be paid. And, you know, the debt, the debt is due and owing. It's been owed, <laughs> due and owing for a long time already right and like you said 10 years though we got in a 10-year reprieve but with that 10-year reprieve has come complacency on a massive scale you know it's that old uh, thing nothing can go wrong go wrong go wrong go wrong and i think that's where we're at now anyway that's it for today